Hello everyone and welcome to EduSearch Clinics. This is the second part of our video on clinical features and differentials. As we discussed in the previous video, there are a lot of differentials to inflammatory bowel disease and these are the common differentials that we are going to study in this series. So by the time the diagnosis of IBD and the phase 1 of inflammatory bowel disease natural history is over, you will have a fairly good idea of how to diagnose all these conditions, okay? So, to start with the clinical history part, is in India, intestinal tuberculosis is one of the most common differential diagnosis, especially for Crohn's disease, but less commonly for ulcerative colitis. Very common disease seen in our practice. So, I'm sure a lot of you know most about intestinal tuberculosis. Just to highlight some of the common clinical history pointers, age group is 20 to 50 years of age. Presentation can be varied. It can be non-specific abdominal pain and colic. Presentation is nausea and vomiting, anorexia and weight loss. This is usually when the patient has an intestinal structure. Fever with evening rise, high grade and chills and rigors. This is the classical fever of intestinal TB. Patient can have simultaneous pulmonary or other site extra pulmonary TB or there is a past history of treated or incompletely treated TB. In family history, there can be a positive case in the family or close community. This is fairly common in our country. The patients can also present with an ileocecal mass, can present with tubercular appendicitis or small bowel obstruction due to stricture. So, all these points give you an idea that the patient can have intestinal tuberculosis. Now, going to infective colitis, there are some specific history points that can point you towards the diagnosis and these are the points that you need to study in order to reach a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. One is history of recent travel to endemic areas, entamoeba, histolytica, amoebiasis, intestinal is very common. Consumption of contaminated food and water, history of contact or presence of more affected members in family or course community. All these points can point toward infective colitis. The presentation can be mild or severe, abdominal pain, diarrhea with or without blood in stools, fever, generalized fatigue and malaise are common presentations of infective colitis. Understand that the Type of fever is different in infective colitis than intestinal tuberculosis and diarrhea with blood in stools is fairly common in infective colitis. If the patient has an infection of enterohemorrhagic E. coli, which is a differential for acute severe toxic colitis, which is also seen in ulcerative colitis and ischemic colitis, then the patient can have infective hemorrhagic colitis, which is due to Enterohemorrhagic E. coli infection. Remember the differentials are ulcerative colitis in acute severe form and ischemic colitis. In immunocompromised patients such as patients with HIV or patients on prolonged steroid intake, patients on chemotherapy, malignancy or on immunosuppression, you can have infective colitis due to cytomegalovirus, isospora, cyclospora, cryptosporidium and so on. So, all these infective colitis also need to be kept in mind. And all these history points need to be taken to achieve a diagnosis of IBD. Coming to ischemic enteritis or ischemic colitis, understand that ischemia can affect both small intestine and large intestine. So, ischemic enteritis or colitis. Understand the commonest types of ischemic enteritis and colitis. Ischemic enteritis, embolic is more common than non-occlusive vasospastic, which is more common than thrombotic, which is more common than venous thrombotic. So, for ischemic enteritis or small bowel disease, arterial embolus is more common than vasospasm, which is more common than thrombosis and venous thrombotic is the least common. On the other hand, in ischemic colitis, vasospastic is more common than embolus or thrombus. Okay, Very commonly asked questions, important to understand because the therapeutic options change based on the site of ischemia that you have in the intestine. 
So prolonged hypotensive states, history of peripheral arterial insufficiency, cerebrovascular or coronary insufficiency are all risk factors. So as I always used to remember, just like KFC for stool, okay? So is smoking, steroids, OC pills, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. All these are risk factors for prothrombotic states. So smoking, steroids, OC pills, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. This history is very important to take. You have patients with hypercoagulable states, okay, such as factor C, protein S, factor V, leaden, okay. All those points also need to be covered in the history. And pregnant patients are hypercoagulable states. Presentation again of this disease can be acute or chronic. When you have acute ischemic colitis, you rule out acute severe colitis due to ulcerative colitis or hemorrhagic colitis due to infection. Chronic disease, ulcerative colitis can mimic this chronic presentation and small bowel stricture can mimic Crohn's disease. Okay, so patients will have postprandial pain and fullness. There will be intestinal angina. There will be food fear. Okay, patients are afraid to eat because they have postprandial pain. And this will lead to weight loss and malabsorption, which can be due to ischemic strictures or due to postprandial pain that is unaddressed. So ischemic enteritis and colitis, all these points are important in history and presentation can be acute or chronic, needs to be kept in mind. Irritable bowel syndrome is a separate topic, but we know the key pointers to irritable bowel syndrome. It's more common in females. Age is less than 50 years. The symptoms are exacerbated by meals, especially the diarrhea type of IBS. They don't have extra intestinal manifestations. There can be presence of dyspepsia as well as non-GI complaints. So the classic triad of presentation, that is how I used to remember that you have GI as well as non-GI symptoms. Okay, And there are absence of alarming features of colorectal cancer. So... Basically, if you have GI plus non-GI, but no extra intestinal, remember that ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease also have extra intestinal manifestations, but non-GI symptoms of IBS are different from extra intestinal manifestations of IBD. Okay, so IBS does not have extra intestinal manifestations, but it has GI symptoms such as dyspepsia, diarrhea, constipation with non-GI symptoms such as psychosocial stress, insomnia, dyspareunia, cystitis, headache and there is associated absence of alarming features such as anemia, weight loss, family history of colorectal cancer. So if you can identify this entire spectrum, patient more commonly has irritable bowel syndrome it is usually a diagnosis of exclusion. So once you have ruled out all these differential diagnoses, including IBD, you can label your patient as irritable bowel syndrome. Now coming to rare differentials, okay, there is something known as solitary rectal ulcer syndrome. It is actually a misnomer and it represents functional constipation with pelvic floor dyssynergy. It is a misnomer because there can be single or multiple anterior rectal ulcers with or without inflammation. All these words are MCQs, single or multiple anterior rectal ulcers with or without inflammation. Patients can also have rectal polyps. This is limited to the last 10 to 12 centimeters of rectum and Remember that SRUS is more a manifestation of pelvic floor dyssynergy. Patients usually have a long-standing history of functional constipation. That is how you can differentiate SRUS from IBD. Endometriosis of rectosigmoid junction. The pain is recurrent and endometric deposits are not under hormonal influence. The patients can present with intestinal obstruction. However, the symptoms are not cyclical. Okay, So understand that endometrium that is separate from uterus is not under hormonal influence and so the symptoms are not cyclical. Recurrent pelvic pain of unknown origin. This is one of the differential diagnoses.
CNSU is more common in young females. Okay, more common presentation is anemia, which is hypochromic microcytic with growth retardation. They rarely have other symptoms such as diarrhea, hematochezia or fever. Okay. So, this is the differentiating point. The patients present with anemia with or without growth retardation, usually young females, and they don't have symptoms like fever, diarrhea, or hematochezia. See, NS, you understand that there is no M in the names, and that is why it's more common in females. On the other end, CMUSE, there is M multifocal in males. Okay. This presence with diarrhea, weight loss, and edema, chronic relapsing, coarse. And there can be recurrent intestinal obstruction due to small intestinal strictures. So, the name itself suggests it is ulcerating stenosing enteropathy. Okay. So, it can lead to intestinal obstruction. It is more common in males. And there can be diarrhea, weight loss. Okay. And chronic relapsing course. So, that is the difference between CNSU, females anemia, CMUSE, males obstruction. There are usually no signs of infection or inflammation in this condition. Bessage disease, chronic relapsing and remitting systemic vasculitis, which can affect the intestinal vessels also. Okay. Usual manifestations are neurologic, ocular, intestinal or vascular. In neurological symptoms, the patient can have eye-related problem, papillitis, papilledema or stroke. Ocular symptoms, the posterior uveitis, episcleritis, scleritis. Vascular manifestations can be endomyocarditis, pulmonary arteritis and arthritis. And usually these patients have triad of oro-oculogenital ephthroid ulcers. Okay. All these are very commonly as MCQ, something that you need to keep in mind so that intestinal Bessage disease is not missed out. When it affects the intestine, the most common site is ileocecal valve and the most common differential is Crohn's disease. So, it can have oro-oculogenital ophthoid ulcers, that is a triad. Neurological, ocular, vascular and joint symptoms are very common. In intestine, most common site is ileocecal valve and most common differential is Crohn's disease. So, that is the differential diagnosis of assets. Disease. Okay. Now coming to pseudomembranous colitis, you all know there is drug history with symptoms of enterocolitis. The drugs can be antibiotics or chemotherapy drugs. And once you know this history, you need to suspect pseudomembranous colitis. Remember, don't not to do bowel prep. We will see this in the endoscopy part. But the pseudomembranes can be washed out by bowel prep. So don't do bowel prep if you suspect pseudomembranous colitis. Eosinophilic enteritis, there is something known as a clean classification for the extent of involvement. Manifestations can be periumbilical pain, nausea, vomiting and diarrhea that occurs with mucosal involvement. And stenosis and obstruction can occur once muscularis is involved. So, clean classification commonly as MCQ. Extent of involvement of intestinal wall in eosinophilic enteritis. Mucosal involvement leads to nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, pain. Muscularis is involved can lead to stenosis, stricture and obstruction. When you have subserosal or serosal involvement towards the end of the disease, it can lead to ascites or pleural effusion. Right, So that is eosinophilic enteritis. So, to summarize, we have seen all these conditions. I know an extensive video if you have not heard of these conditions before. But what I would suggest is go through this two, three times. Understand the differentials. These are very common diseases that we see in practice. It is not that any of them is rare. Okay. And if you know all these clinical features, your next steps in diagnosis of IBD becomes very easy. Okay, so I'll go through this video two, three times. Try to remember all these conditions. All these points help you in taking history in a colon and small bowel case. Okay, so go through this again. And in the next video, we will then continue to laboratory findings and imaging differentials for IBD. Colorectal cancer, like I said, is also...
a part of natural history of IBD and so we are not separately discussing it as a differential diagnosis. So we have seen clinical pulse, IBD related cases. If you have forgotten this, go through the first part of the clinical features video. Okay. Thank you.